All right, it is finally time for another project and this is definitely a little bit of a crazy one. This is my four foot by two foot by 16 inch PVC enclosure that I use for my Brazilian rainbow boa enclosure. As many of you know, PVC cages and enclosures are incredibly popular in the hobby, but in my opinion, they do have some major limitations that we don't often talk about, mainly to do with lighting, ventilation, and I would throw heating into that category as well. So we're gonna solve a bunch of those problems in today's video and I'm gonna break a few Brazilian rainbow boa husbandry rules in the process. I wanna make this video quite short, so we're just gonna kind of fire through these different things. So if you have questions about one of these steps, definitely put it in the comments and I can go and do another video where I explain things in more detail. But this is just gonna be a video where I just quickly go through everything that I did to change this enclosure. So one really quick thing I wanna say before we jump into today's video. Most care guides for rainbow boas online will recommend a cage minimum cage size of four feet long by two feet wide. And that's what this cage is. But personally, I do feel that is a bit small and I do want to upgrade her in the next year or so to something that's maybe six feet long. So I think if you do have an adult rainbow boa, that should be your goal, six feet at least. But I would be a complete hypocrite if I said you can't use a four foot enclosure because that's what I'm gonna use here today. So you might be in the same boat as me where you have a, you know, a cage that you think should be the right size. And then eventually as the animal grows and you see the adult animal, inside the enclosure you think, ah, oh, that seems a little bit small. That's the situation I'm in. I wanna work with this cage to maximize it, make it as awesome as I can, with the goal of eventually upgrading her to a larger cage in the future. Ideally, this animal's with me for 20 plus years from now, and I have time to do that. But for now, let's work with this cage, let's make it awesome, and hopefully that gives you some ideas to maximize the cage that you have at home. Okay, so the first job I need to do is I wanna build a spacer for this enclosure, so it's just gonna lift it up off the shelf a little bit more. And But first, I need to move the rainbow boa into this tub, and this is gonna be your holding tub while I work on this project. Now with Movie Magic, I've actually already completed most of the work for this enclosure, so she should only be in this tub for a few, maybe hours, maybe a day or so. But let's get her in there. Let's see if we can get a shot of her before I put her. I'll add in some good B-roll after this. So as I said, this is not going to be a step-by-step -step tutorial. This video is just going to show you what I did for this project. I will link in the top right corner any videos that I used as tutorials or inspiration that I used along the way. I figured there's no real reason for me to remake videos that other people have already done. So any inspiration that I used will be in the top right corner. And then if you do have specific questions, we'll do another video later where I explain things in more detail. So the first step in this process was building a small spacer or a stand. So I cut up a bunch of wood painted it black and threw it together. I roughly followed the build plans for people who build DIY aquarium stands, although it definitely didn't need to be as structurally sound. And I think it came together quite nicely and it will do the job perfectly. All right, so next up was building the warm hide. So I used the method that I learned when I spoke to Roman Murin in episode number 63 of the Animals at Home podcast. So Roman uses this method to create almost like a heat rock or a, a warm slab in the enclosure and I'm going to actually use it for the lid of a hide. So essentially you take sand and PVA glue which is just your regular white glue and mix it up to form sort of a cement. Now you place that cement on top of a ceramic tile but before you do so you take a metal rod and place it on the tile so that the metal rod is actually embedded inside the sand concrete slab. So the purpose of the metal rod is to allow the injection of the thermostat probe into the sand slab. This allows for incredibly stable temperature control. In the corner, I'm linking a video that Joseph created from JTP Reptiles where he goes into this concept much further. But just quickly, you have to imagine that if you just place the thermostat probe into your enclosure, there are so many different variables that can affect the way it is sensing the temperature of the environment. For example, if your animal lays on it or moves it or it gets wet or there's a draft, so embedding the thermostat probe into the sand slab creates incredibly stable temperature control. There's almost no environmental shift that can cause the, the probe itself to change temperatures rapidly. Now because the slab is basically entirely made of sand or rock, it has a very high heat capacity, meaning it has the great ability to absorb the heat and the energy from the halogen bulb that's sitting above it. It will slowly warm up. It holds a very, very stable, stable temperature because there's so much mass there. And when the lights turn off, it slowly cools down. 
So as you can see here, I've mixed the sand and the glue together and I used cement coloring to make the final product a darker color to better absorb light. Now this is the consistency that you want, or this might even be a little bit thinner than you want. The first time I did this, I made it way too thin. It was runny, as you can see in this video shot here, and it just didn't work. The end product had you know, a layer of thick glue on top that rose to the top and whatnot. It was a terrible mess. So this is the consistency that you want. You can probably even be a little bit thinner. I dumped this on top of the ceramic tile inside a border that I made out of cardboard cardboard and I let it dry for a few days and I even put it in the oven at around 200 degrees to help speed up the drying process. So once it was completely dry and it does dry as hard as a rock, I peeled off all of the cardboard walls that were holding it in. And as you can see, where I had Gorilla Tape that was holding the walls up, it peeled off really nice and clean. And where I didn't, the cardboard peeled and ripped off, which was kind of annoying and I couldn't get it off. So if I was to do that again, I would actually probably wrap the entire inside of the cardboard moat with some kind of tape. So to cover that up, I used silicone and sand and just sealed that so you couldn't see the white cardboard showing. So as I said, the sand slab is quite heavy, so I wanted to make sure the walls of the hide were very sturdy. So I used two by sixes to build a frame and I painted them black and I used no more nails to connect the lid with the frame. I also used silicone on the inside to seal it and add a little bit more support. Now one thing you'll notice right away is I do not have a back wall on the hide, which probably looks a little bit weird. And I will explain that further on in the video, but just to give you a hint, it's going to allow for cryptic basking. So here's a final shot of the hide, and yes, it does look quite intense. The good news is, is if a Category 4 hurricane rips through her enclosure, she will have a storm bunker to hide in. Now onto the most significant part of this project, and that is the water feature. So as I said at the beginning, I am breaking a few classic rainbow boa husbandry rules that people tend to follow. Typically people say you should stay away from over the top heat bulb heating and stay with heat mats or radiant heat panels. And I am not doing that, I'm going to a heat bulb. And then the second thing people tend to say with rainbow boa care is you should reduce the ventilation as much as possible. This is a species that does require higher humidity, so both of those rules make sense. I am gonna break both of them. And because I'm breaking both of those rules, which I'll describe later on in this video, I knew I needed a very significant amount of water in this enclosure to maintain humidity. So that is what I'm doing here, here I am constructing a small little tank that we're going to use to make a kind of mini river slash pond-ish thing. So once the silicone on the little tank was dry, I painted the outside of the glass with black glass paint that I picked up from a craft store. First I used a paintbrush, but that made a lot of brush strokes, so I did the final three coats with a foam roller. Next, I drilled two half-inch holes into the side of the tank and fitted them both with bulkheads with strainers. The bottom bulkhead is a drain and the top bulkhead is an overflow. And now for the messy and time-consuming part. I encased the entire tank with Great Stuff expanding foam. I added a couple small pots for live plants that we'll be adding later on in this video and the straws are there to maintain the drainage out of the pots. I also added this cool piece of Malaysian driftwood. Now this piece of wood is gonna act as a humidity sink, which might be a term I just made up, I'm not sure, and it's also gonna be a place for the water to trickle out of. I got this idea from a video that Troy Goldberg did. Definitely go check his video out. He does a much better job than me and he really explains it in detail, but he's the one that gave me this idea. I'll link that in the top right corner. Once the foam was dry, I tried to do what Troy does and just grab it off and rip it off with your hands rather than cutting it with a, a knife because it just leaves kind of a more unique and natural texture when you just rip it. But honestly, he must have the finger strength of Hercules because my hands got so tired after like five minutes of this, so I did end up cutting most of it off. Once all of the excess foam was removed and it was roughly in a shape that I was happy with, I coated everything in dry lock. I used original dry lock in the gray color and mixed it with charcoal cement coloring. I used a couple of different bins so I could have a few different shades of gray to work with. 
Of course, if you're painting fake rocks, you're going to want several different shades of gray and a few lighter colors and some blacks to add some detail and definition. However, I initially tried to do all of this at once, you know, throw the first layer down of the dark charcoal gray and then go back and add some details. But what I found is if the initial layer was still wet, it would just mix with itself on the foam and then just create one standard gray color. So I found it was much more effective to just coat all of the foam with one single gray color, let it completely dry, and then come back and add detail work. To add some definition to this rock, I took a dry paintbrush and just slightly dipped it into the gray dry lock without any of the cement coloring, and then just came over and just slightly brushed the entire side of all of the foam. What that did is it just picked up on the edges and the rough spots, and it highlighted all the ridges and the cracks and the crevices and whatnot, and I think it actually turned out quite nice. So we will return to the water feature in a little bit, but first I want to show you how I did the humid hide. So as I said, the ventilation is going to be increased in this enclosure, so it is very, very important that the snake has access to a humid box inside the enclosure. Humid hides do pose a little bit of a challenge when it comes to aesthetics, because really using a plastic box is the most effective at trapping in the humidity and also not rotting and going bad if you use wood or something. I thought about using ceramic, but then I thought, man, then I'm going to have two ridiculously heavy hides in here. So I ended up going with a plastic box, but I did want to add a little bit of detail to it. So I blasted a hole through the middle with a giant hole saw and added a piece of cork bark to act sort of like a tunnel into this humid box. So it would sort of seem like she's going underground or maybe under a tree into an area where she's going to have sphagnum moss and, and it'll be nice and moist in there. So I initially took a cork round and spray foamed it on top of the hole to act as an access way into the hide. I then carved out the foam to add a little bit of detail but as you can see here the foam was not strong enough to hold the cork round on the hide so it ended up just snapping off once it was dry but that wasn't really a big deal because then I was able to add the dry lock and some detail on the cork round before reattaching it to the hide with some Gorilla Glue. Again, I'm not super stoked on the way this hide looks. It is kind of a plastic bin, but it's going to be slightly hidden behind the water feature as well as there's some plants that are going to be in front of it, and it's black, so it does kind of blend in. But the really nice things about this hide is that I can grab it and pull it out of the enclosure completely. So if she's in it, I actually don't have to bother her. I can just pull the hide right out, and I can clean it if I need to out of the enclosure. The fact that it has a bottom will come in handy. So speaking of increased ventilation, I installed a computer fan onto the side of this enclosure. So I purchased this fan off of Amazon, and if you are looking for any of the equipment or supplies that I use throughout this video, just check the description. I do have links for everything there. This particular package of fans actually came with two separate PC fans, and I thought I was going to use both, but I certainly only needed one, and it did come with these sort of safety grill things that I was able to install. I installed one on each side. This allowed for the fan blades to sit about three or four centimeters back off the enclosure so there's absolutely no way she can get her nose into the fan or her tongue through the grill far enough to reach the fan blades. Now I situated this fan directly above the pond and I was kind of hoping that as the fan blew air it would blow air over top the wet wood as well as the surface of the water and that would kind of act like a natural humidifier and maybe promote some evaporation of the water off of the water system into the air. Now, it doesn't seem to be working quite that way. Of course, the air is super dry in my apartment right now, so it's pulling in very dry air. So I thought maybe I would get lucky and the fan would actually help increase humidity, but it does make the humidity drop, the, or the relative humidity drop inside the enclosure when I do turn the fan on, but it is not a big deal at all. The humidity in this enclosure is actually functioning perfectly, and I have a very interesting way of controlling this fan, which I will show later on in this video. So I also drilled a large hole on the top of the warm side of the enclosure. This is for the halogen bulb to allow the light to enter the enclosure, and I sealed it with a metal mesh. This will also act as an exhaust for the fan. All right, back to the water feature and to every reptile keeper's worst nightmare, plumbing and water. If you keep aquariums, you're probably not afraid of it, but if you only keep reptiles, it's definitely something to be afraid of. 
So I added two threaded adapters to the bulkheads and then drilled two holes through the PVC enclosure to allow the bulkheads to poke through the other side. And I also drilled holes through the wooden stand to allow the plumbing to be threaded underneath the enclosure to a basin which is going to hold the pump and the water. So to finish setting up the plumbing, I decided to move everything back in place into the reptile room. So move the stand back and the enclosure back. So I've designed this plumbing in a way where everything can be removed if needed. So that includes the water feature inside the enclosure, the basin underneath the enclosure. Nothing has been hard plumbed. So if needed, everything can be unthreaded and moved. So again, the top bulkhead is the overflow, so as the pond fills up, it'll eventually trickle down that bulkhead back into the basin underneath. And the bottom bulkhead is a drain, so when I want to remove all of the water, it's very simple. I just turn the ball valve and it will empty about 95% of the water inside the pond. So I actually forgot to film the pump before I installed it into the basin, but here's a shot of the box as well as the pump inside the basin. And again, this is off Amazon. If you want to pick yourself up one of these, there is a link in the description. This pump pumps at a rate of 80 gallons per hour, although I'm using my tubing from my misting system from my day gecko, which is quite a bit smaller than the actual port at the top of the pump. So it is probably pumping at a rate, I would say probably even at half that, maybe like 40 gallons per hour or something along those lines. And I also installed a button switch on the cord of the pump. That way I can turn the pump on and off very simply without looking for the outlet. And here's just a shot of how lightly the water trickles out the end of the tube. So the basin itself is a 34 quart stair light tub. And as I said, everything can be removed, including this tub. So I can just unthread it from the plumbing system and pull it right out if I need to pull it out to clean it. But it's not something I'm going to have to do on a regular basis. I think maybe once or twice a month. I'm certainly I'm not going to have to do it every single week. And because there is so much water in this system, it's probably around 15 to 17 liters. I'm not going to have to change the water every single day like you would normally do with your water dish in a regular water bowl because that water is stagnant. It's not moving. This water is fresh and it's moving all the time. So I think I'll probably only have to change it maybe once or twice a week type thing. And obviously it would be a nuisance for me to have to take the entire basin and carry it to the sink and empty it and then refill it and carry it back. So to avoid that, I actually installed a water changing port. The water changing port connects directly to a Python water changer that you would see in the aquarium hobby. That's one that uses the vacuum pressure from the sink to actually suck up the water out of the tank. And then you can change the setting to refill the tank. So simply all I have to do here is turn the ball valve on the actual pond that empties 90% of the pond into the basin. Then I can draw all the water out of the basin into the sink and out the drain. And then I just simply change the setting on the Python itself to refill the basin. So I fill the basin back up almost to the top and then ultimately the pump will slowly draw the water from the basin back into the pond and it will fill up. And it's as simple as that. It's not a bad job at all. It's only about eight or nine minutes to do the entire round trip for the water change. All right, on to the final few steps of this process. I added a strip of LED lighting. That is the lighting that I already had in this enclosure. It's very simple and cheap. Again, this is off of Amazon. And then for the bulb, I used a 60-watt halogen bulb, a dimble halogen bulb, which is super important because it was connected to a Spyro Robotics Herpstat EZ1. And this is a proportional thermostat, meaning it's not going to just click on and off. It's slowly going to dim or increase the intensity of the ball based off of the setting that I have. And as I said, placing the thermostat probe directly into the metal tube into the top portion, the top slab of the hide has really, really made stable temperature control. And as I said earlier, I did not put a back wall on this hide specifically to allow for cryptic basking. If you're not sure what cryptic basking is, that is when an animal will try to hide most of its body and then leave a little bit of its body, maybe half a coil out, exposed to the sun to allow it to absorb the infrared and the UVB rays of the sun. So this hide will allow the animal to do that. She can be in her warm hide and there's a sliver of light coming through the back that will both allow for the UV as well as the halogen. 
So in this shot, I turned off all the other lights in the room and only turned on the Arcadia Shade Dweller. I just want you to see what the light looks like on the inside of the hide. You can see there's a small patch of light in the back of the hide that will come through and the rest of it is relatively shaded. Okay, so this is what I was talking about earlier when I said I had a neat way of controlling the fan. So this is a Leviton Wi-Fi plug or dimmer, and it is controlled through the Wi-Fi. So I have an app on my phone that allows me to turn the fan on and off very simply without having to reach for the switch. But what's even more exciting about the app is it allows me to create a schedule. So I can have a list of different times of the day when the fan turns on and off, and I can have it as fine-tuned as only coming on for a single minute at a time. So as I've already said, and I'm sure you already know, maintaining humidity in a Brazilian rainbow boa enclosure is crucial. Hence, that is why the humid hide is so important. The humid hide that I'll set up in a second here has always maintained a humidity of over 90% without issue. And I find that with the halogen bulb, my driest part of the enclosure drops down to about 60% during the day. And that might sound scary for some people, but again, that's only one part near the halogen bulb. The rest of the enclosure seems to sit around 70 during the day with the humid hide sitting around 90, but at nighttime, the humidity rises throughout the entire enclosure up to about 88 to 90 percent through the entire enclosure. So that is when I'm going to want to be running the fan, and it's only going to be in short bursts. I'm going to have it running for a few times a night, maybe a minute or two at a time. That way it can flush, clean the air, give a good fresh air without dropping the humidity really at all. As soon as the fan turns off, the humidity rises right back up to where it was within a few minutes. So I decided I wanted to create a visual break in front of the warm hide. That way, if she wanted to bask on top of the hide, on top of the slab, she would feel somewhat secure and feel like she's behind something. So I decided I would use three vertical branches in front, but they needed to be removable because that would be way too much of a pain to get that hide out or clean if I left them permanently in there. So I found a nice long branch outside and cut them into 16 inch lengths. And then I drilled a hole right down the center and filled the hole with Gorilla Glue. I then inserted a hanger bolt into the hole. So here's the simple method I use to actually insert hanger bolts into a hole. You just take two wing nuts, lock them together, and then you can thread them down. In this case, it did get too hard for me to thread by hand, so I just used a pair of pliers and finished the job. And of course, I needed to drill a hole into the top of the enclosure for the hanger bolt to fit through. And finally, just a washer on top, finished off with a wing nut, allows me to easily remove them when I need to. All right, so onto the final few touches here. I planted pothos into the three little pots inside the water feature. I scattered the floor with a whole bunch of leaf litter. In the wild, rainbow boas spend a large majority of their time on the floor of the rainforest, which of course is covered with leaves and they tend to like to hide under it. So I love to add a lot into rainbow boa enclosures. So on the top of the enclosure, we have all the electronics that are controlling and sensing this enclosure. So on the far left, that's my hydrometer for my humid hide. Of course, I want that one to always be reading 85 plus. And then the next two hydrometers are just throughout the middle of the enclosure, closer to the warm side and close to the halogen bulb. So by the end of the day, they do drop into the low 60s, the mid 60s, which is perfectly fine. At night, they pop back up to 85 to 80 percent without any issues. So again, I've talked about this before on the channel. Humidity spikes during the night and the evening and in the early morning. That's when you're going to get this wave of humidity. During the day when the sun rises, the sun evaporates any moisture in the air and the humidity tends to drop. Especially if you're in certain areas, if you're basking on top of a rock, for example, there's going to be relatively low humidity there because the sun is heating up the air in that section. That's why the humid hide is so important. The snake is always going to have a place to go that is nice, moist, and humid, and the rest of the enclosure is going to run through a normal, natural humidity cycle. In the evening, when she's the most active, the humidity is always going to be 85 plus throughout the entire thing, but in the day, especially into the afternoon, late evening, when the bulb has been on all day, the humidity does drop in the middle of the enclosure to about 65-60%, which is not a big deal at all. 
Overall, I would say I'm about 80% happy with this enclosure. I'm really happy with each individual feature that I added into this enclosure. I think the water feature works great. The humid hide is working well. The warm hide is working excellent. And everything was, you know, relatively well thought out. I'm just not happy with the size. Of course, I built everything out of the enclosure. And once I got them into the enclosure, everything filled up the space a lot more than I was expecting it to. And I really don't like working with these 16 inch tall enclosures. Even if you have an animal that spends a lot of their time on the ground, like rainbow boas, they do climb a little bit, but they do spend most of their time on the ground. 16 inches just doesn't give you enough freedom to move and, and, and you know, make the space something that could be much greater. And for that reason, I definitely want to be upgrading to something much larger in the future. But for now, I'm excited to see how she uses the space. I'm excited to see how she starts basking and using the water feature. That tub is so much larger than she's had in the past. It allows her to swim and fully soak and fully submerge herself in a way that she's never been able to before. Live plants in there, which is going to be another you know sense of enrichment for her. The vertical branches are going to be something great for her to shed against and climb through and climb up. So here's a final shot of me adding her back into the enclosure. She checked out her new pond for a little bit and swam for a couple seconds. And of course, she did what every boa does and decided to cram herself in this strange corner underneath her humid hide, which is what she spent her you know, first few hours in the enclosure, burying herself beneath the hide. But she did eventually come out and then she went back into the humid hide. And that's where she's been for the last day or so. She seems to be enjoying it. Of course, I expect it to be a few days or maybe even a week or two of her adjusting to the new environment. And if you do want to see more videos of her in this enclosure, definitely subscribe subscribe to the channel because I will eventually do an update on this, which of course will include video of her cruising around and interacting with the different features of the enclosure. And overall, this was just a really good learning experience for me. Every mini project that I did within the greater project as a whole is something that I've not really tackled before. So now I have these new skill sets that I can use as I continue to improve the enclosures and the lives of the animals that I keep. So again, as I said at the beginning, this is not a tutorial video. This wasn't a how-to step-by-step. So if you do have specific questions about each individual project, put them in the comments and I'm going to collect a bunch of the list of questions. And then maybe in a week or so, I'll come back and I'll answer all those questions in one video. So it'll be kind of a two-part series in that sense. Thank you very much for watching this video. I do hope you enjoy it. If you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. But of course, the podcast is here as well, the Animals at Home podcast. You can find that at animalsathomenetwork.com. We have a many, many different guests and amazing shows on that channel. So definitely check that out. And if you do want to pick yourself up an Animals at Home t-shirt, which helps support rainforest conservation, head to animalsathome.ca slash shop. I will catch you guys in the next video.